Well, may I welcome you all, uh, family and friends, uh, to this service of thanksgiving for the life of Ray Reesness. Um, this is a sad occasion because we will be reminded as we go through the service of the sorrows of life and of death, but it's also a joyful day because we shall be giving thanks to God uh, with great gratitude for the life of Ray Reesness. And as we do so, it's good that we're able to be together as a congregation here, as the Bible encourages us to do, to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. So let us pray as we begin our service of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we thank you for this occasion. We have been deeply saddened and troubled by so many aspects of life, last year and this year. And we're truly thankful that we can hold this service here today. We praise you and worship you for who you are, for your grace and mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know we are weak, but you are strong. We know we are sinners, but you are the God who forgives. We know we are helpless in the face of death, but you, Lord Jesus, are the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. Father in heaven, please be with us, we pray, throughout this service now, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, may I again say how good it is to have everybody here and thank you for those who've worked hard already to make this service of thanksgiving possible uh, and a welcome to those who may be watching and listening uh, from elsewhere uh, and we're so glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. We're going to begin with um, uh, an old hymn which is very well known to some of us but perhaps not to everyone and uh, this hymn, uh, the first one on our order of service which I hope you have a copy of, uh, it tells us very simply of the life and death and burial uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially then of his resurrection. And it tells also of the reason that he came. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Well, I'll let you sing it rather than me read it all. So let's stand and sing together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises.
appreciate it. I, I was just thinking that um, Ray would have loved uh, singing that hymn, and he would love the fact that it was quite long and needed some good singing. Uh, so thank you for doing that. It's a, it's a lovely hymn. It tells the whole story uh, of Jesus coming and his coming again at the end. Now, whether Ray would have liked the next part of the service, I don't know, but we're going to think about him, uh, and we're going to hear from various members of the family, and it's, it's very good of you to be here and to plan this. I, I know uh, that it's, it's a lot of work to, to work out who's going to say what and uh, in what order, and I'm just simply going to just say, as you've got the names on your order of service, that we're going to hear, first of all, something about Ray's life uh, from his, his daughter, Helen, uh, and then Mike, Ray's grandson, is going to come and read a Bible reading from the Old Testament, Psalm 46. And then we're going to have some memories, personal memories from individual members of the family, uh, from Suki, Ray's daughter-in-law, from Susie, Ray's granddaughter, and then from Peter, Ray's nephew. So I, I won't come up each time and introduce you. I think you know who each other are. So uh, just follow on uh, with those things. So thank you very much for coming and taking part. And we begin with Helen. account of dad's life and uh, I'm just going to read it to you now. So dad was born on the 4th of August 1928 in London as the second son to Kristen and Ethel Reesness. They lived at 23 Chobham Road in the east end of London in an old house that was so big some of the rooms were let out to other people. He and his brothers were initially educated at home by our grandma who Dad described as very strict, and he said that he didn't particularly get on with either of his parents all of the time. When he turned 10, he was sent to Water Lane Boys' School. He was put in a class with his elder brother, Eric, and when the teacher called the register, she would say, Reese Ness Eric, ditto Ray. So Dad became known to his schoolmates by the nickname Ditto. Two more brothers, Harold and Edwin, were born, and as a family they practiced their Christian faith by meeting in the homes of other Christians. As a family, they had holidays at St Leonard's, Canvey Island, Saxmundham and Dickleborough, all happy memories for Dad. These would involve cycling many miles to get there and back, and plenty of outdoor activities. He said that all sorts went on when four brothers were allowed to amuse themselves. In 1939, when Dad was 11, he'd moved to attending West Ham Secondary School when the war broke out. Although many children were sent to the country as evacuees, my grandma was adamant that she would keep the children in London and that God would protect them. And he did. Living through the war in London whilst aged 11 to 17, understandably had a long-term effect on Dad and he frequently referred back to it. It dominated his childhood. He told many hair-raising stories of his escapades on bomb sites, hitting bullets they found with a hammer and hunting for remnants following explosions, like you do. <laughs> he also remembered the shock when his school friend David was killed overnight in a bombing raid. The class teacher sent Dad to David's house at lunchtime to find out why he wasn't in school. The house had been destroyed and Dad was told by workmen clearing up that the family who lived there had all been killed. He returned to school to inform his teacher, who he remembered crying, but she told him to go back to the class for the afternoon, which he did. When aged 14, the family moved to 54 Claremont Road in Forest Gate, and from the age of 16 to, to just 19, he gained a first-class honours degree in engineering from the University of London. In 1947, he did national service in the RAF, and on one visit home to the East End, 
On the 29th of March 1949, he met our mum, Joyce, at a dance. He was 20 and she was 17 and still at school. He said years later that the ballroom dancing lessons that he had taken had paid off because mum had seen him impressed. In September 1949, he moved to Manchester to do an engineering apprenticeship. And whilst there, on the 2nd of February 1950, he became a Christian. It was mainly through dad's witness to mum that she too became a Christian a few months later. Much to dad's amazement and happiness, in 1951, his firm moved him back to the East End for six months to near where mum lived and afterwards he was moved back to Stockport. Mum and Dad married on the 18th of October 1952 at Highway Hall in London and they honeymooned on the southeast coast. Whilst living in Stockport, they had their first baby, Anne, who unfortunately only lived a day. They subsequently had Ruth, who was born in <coughs> London. Throughout his life, Dad had an interest in France and for spreading the Christian message there. He was taught French by our grandma and spoke it sufficiently to communicate on his many visits. As a young man, he joined teams visiting French villages and subsequently he and mum supported a number of missionaries there, including Margaret Nurse, who's with us today. One summer in the 1970s, he went to France with Operation Mobilisation and my sister Ruth joined him there. So they moved again in 1955 to Bedford for Dad to start a job as a steam turbine designer. And whilst there, they had Joy, Andy and me. They bought a brand new house, 66 Leesway, in 1956 for around £3,000. During our childhood, Dad built a model railway in our back garden. It ran from the garage through the back of the coal bunker and the outside toilet and down the garden to a turntable so that it could do the return journey. However, this wasn't for us to play with. It was part of his lifelong passion for model railways and was quickly followed by an extensive model railway layout that eventually filled the whole loft. Dad loved to go to model railway exhibitions and swap meets where he would acquire books, maps, lots of model railway gear that was secretly stashed in the loft. I don't think Mum had any idea how much he'd accumulated. He also ran a small scale repair service for model railway rolling stock. He would receive broken items in parcels from all around the world, which he carefully repaired and returned to very grateful enthusiasts. Dad was also very knowledgeable about steam trains, trams and trolley buses and he enjoyed his hobby, collecting an enormous array of related books, timetables, maps and magazines. This also featured on family holidays or days out. When it was time to stop for a journey break, we inexplicably always seemed to come across a signal box, a disused railway tunnel, level crossing, or other railway-related place that needed exploring. Not long after moving to Bedford, they started to attend this church here, Russell Park Baptist Church, as it was then. Dad became a deacon, and for 25 years, he ran the Sunday school here. When we were young, Dad would read us stories after dinner each night. He read the William books, Toad of Toad Hall, Swallows and Amazons, and many other of his favourite childhood books, which he would laugh uncontrollably at whilst reading. In 1970, Dad started a new job as a lecturer at Manda College, now part of the University of Bedfordshire, where he worked until retirement. To his credit, when the subjects he taught became superseded by technology, he taught maths and other subjects that he was able to grasp because of his engineering background. <clears throat> Having a father who was Norwegian gave Dad an understandable interest in visiting the country and in 1974 the opportunity came for a family holiday there with our grandparents. We had our eyes opened to an amazingly beautiful country and dad remembered this with pleasure for the rest of his life. In retirement dad continued to enjoy his hobbies, did puzzles and watched TV 
Whilst members of Brickhill Baptist Church, he became a home group leader, and he and Mum visited old people's homes to lead singing in old hymns and carols at Christmas time. They also went to Hope Church Goldington for many years, and the people there were very supportive to both Mum and Dad in their later years. After losing Mum, and as his health failed, Dad was moved to Wren Hall Nursing Home in Nottinghamshire for his final three years. The care with which they looked after him was truly amazing. And we are so thankful that they created such a happy place for him, where he was surrounded to the end by kindness, understanding and love. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He utters his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I have some memories of Ray to share with you. Um, when I think of remembering someone's life, I think you do have to have a certain amount of honesty. I'm looking at my, for my daughter here, not too much honesty when my turn comes, please. <laughs> um, and there is no doubt that Ray had his challenges in life. And those struggles often translated into difficult behavior which caused pain for others. I don't believe that the behavior was malicious, but the result of a difficulty in managing his own emotions. As a child, I found Ray rather an intimidating figure. I remember coming to call for joy one day and Ray answered the door he shut the door in my face, and I heard him shout, Joy, there's some scruffy urchin here to see you. Um, I often liked to pull his leg about that, as the scruffy urchin went on to marry his son. <laughs> Ray didn't have a sense of humor in the traditional way, but more a sense of fun. During latter years, I would visit him and the lovely Joyce to try and help a little. I remember taking him to Aldi, as I usually did, but finding that walking round had become too much for him. Without the facility of a wheelchair, I managed to persuade a cashier to lend us a chair, her chair on wheels, not realizing what I had unleashed. I spent the next half an hour chasing round after Ray as he delighted in running amok on the wheelie chair, much to the alarm and amusement of fellow shoppers. I eventually managed to growl him into a corner and wrestle it off him. He had had a whale of a time wearing his traditional mischievous grin 
and it had clearly appealed to his sense of fun. At the cornerstone of everything for Ray was his faith, and his loyalty and love of God was unswerving. Both the lovely Joyce and he shared this devotion throughout their lives. As it turned out, Ray was very blessed by God. Not only was he blessed with a wonderful family, <laughs> but blessed with his wonderful wife, who lovingly and steadfastly stood by his side throughout his adult life. And that was a blessing indeed. Thank you. I thought I would share some of my favorite memories about my granddad. He wasn't a man of many words, but he showed his love in his own way. After our Nana passed away, Joyce, he was finding it very hard to talk to us in sentences. He knew that he always gave the grandchildren pocket money when he saw us, and one of the last times I saw him at Lee's Way, he knew this. He couldn't speak much at the time, so he beckoned me over while sitting on the stool in the kitchen, waiting for his coffee that always had to be way too hot, otherwise he wouldn't drink it. He tipped all the coins that I had in his pocket onto the table. At the time, most of them were copper pennies, but there was a tenpence coin amongst them. He swept it off the table into his hands, took my wrist to hold out my hand, and placed the tempi into it. He closed his hands around mine and smiled before putting all of his pennies back in his pocket. His love for trains followed him from his home in Bedford to Wren Hall. He adorned them and would spend hours excitedly pointing at his favorite trains in the books that we had given him and on the fronts of cards that he was given for his birthday. He would try and find the trains which were on these cards in the books and show them to me with so much happiness. He loved his great-grandchildren, Harry and Jasper. For his 90th birthday celebration, our family went to see him and we had a celebration outside. He let his great-grandchildren help blow out the candles on his cake and he watched them with the biggest smile on his face. And as they were eating cake, he kept forgetting that he actually had a slice of his own. <laughs> when we were really young, his grandchildren, me, Rob, Susie, Sophie, Katie, Sarah, and Michael, would always have an Easter egg hunt in the garden before lunch. At this time, me and Sophie were the youngest, and we couldn't keep up with all of our other cousins. Grandad used to give us hints where the eggs were and help us with get the ones that we couldn't get as we were so small. I remember him eating one of the eggs that he found and thought nobody was looking and offered one to Nana as she told him that the chocolate wasn't for him. We would pray before every meal with him and all the cousins, aunts, uncles and partners all in the small dining room as he would pray. It became a joke in our family that when we are hungry, we would say, I'm hungry, in the way that Grandad used to say when the meals were just a couple of minutes late or a bit longer to serve than we thought. I will always love the French dinners that he would make, they would make us every time that we went to see our grandparents. I will always look back on good memories we had of him. And now he is back with his lovely Joycey. As I uh, reflect on my memories of my Uncle Ray, he was never ditto Ray to me, always Uncle Ray. Three words come to mind, and the first is fun. Suki's already referred to this, but um, we Nottingham Reesnessers always enjoyed visiting our Bedford cousins. It always struck me as being a place of fun and the unexpected. We used to refer to it as 66 Fleas Way. I think a, a name or phrase coined by Ray himself. Apologies to whoever it is that still lives there now. But, uh, but we had great fun there. 
it was always a place of the unexpected, where a cousin here today who remained nameless was dared to jump, no doubt, prompted by siblings out of an upstairs window and lived to tell the tale. And another cousin, sadly no longer here with us today, put their cat in the washing machine because he thought it was dirty. It always struck us as being a place of fun, and I loved that model railway running all around the loft in the house. And I was intrigued by that railway that ran from the garage, as we've already heard, behind the outside toilets around the garden, to think that you could be sat there minding your own business, only to discover a train pass behind where you were sat. Uh, blushing times indeed, or should I say flushing times indeed. I've, I have a book at home on Hornby Double O trains, and there's a picture of Uncle Ray's garden railway in this book. It was quite innovative in its day. He'd even made a power pack that towed behind the train to power it right round his garden. In fact, Ray helped instill in me a love for trains and railways that I've never been able to shake off. In fact, I blame him for having now spent 40 years working on the railways in this country. I remember him taking me along with cousin Andrew over to Sandy to watch the trains whiz by between London and Scotland. We certainly didn't trespass on the railway line like Uncle Ray used to with my father when they were boys near Forest Gate Station, crossing over the two fast lines to put a halfpenny coin on the slow line to discover after a goods train had passed over it that it was larger than a penny. Of course, Ray loved the railways, didn't he? He told me once he'd retired that he enjoyed buying a day travel card here in Bedford and roaming all round the railways of London, joyriding for the day. And I'm sure Auntie Joyce enjoyed a day's peace and quiet. Of course, Ray was no stranger to the railways, was he, and the and London transport. On one occasion, my father told me that when he was younger, he bought his underground ticket. But as he descended the escalator, he remembered he'd not picked up his change. So he turned round on the descending escalator and ran back up it. Can you imagine someone doing that? Running up a descending escalator just to get the change from the clerk up in the ticket office. So when I think of my Uncle Ray, these fun times come to mind and the good influence he was on me. Not like with his brothers during wartime London exploding cartridges, as we've already heard. On one occasion, he made a gun. He filled it with cordite. He put a bullet down the barrel and then he chickened out to pull the lever. So he gave it to my father, his younger brother, and made him pull the trigger. Fortunately, the bullet left the barrel safely without injuring anybody, or some of us wouldn't have been here today. Come to think of it, none of us would have been here today, would we? But a sense of fun. But also, the second word that comes to mind is food. This came back to me a few years ago when Uncle Ray gave me some old railway bits and pieces and they were all packed in old chocolate boxes and sweet boxes, Terry's fruit jellies, after eights, Terry's milk chocolates, to name but a few. I'm quite sure Terry's and Cadbury's turnover took a nosedive as Ray left this scene of time. I have a suspicion he loved his food. I'm told when he was younger and visitors came to the house as a boy, the lights would momentarily go off. But when they came back on again, your cake had disappeared from your plates. And when he was a boy at church, he always volunteered to put the cakes out on the table because from the kitchen to where the food was eaten, there was a long, dark 
corridor at 61 Upton Lane. And by the time the plates reached the table, some of the cakes had mysteriously disappeared. They'd been eaten along that long, dark corridor. Fun, food, but also faith. Whenever we visited Bedford for the weekend, we'd come here to this very church, where, of course, Ray ran the Sunday school. Faith seemed to play an important part in my uncle's life. My sister Annette remembered how Uncle Ray helped her find her first house here in Bedford, having just qualified as a GP, and then helped her sell it to cousin Andrew when she moved practice to Leicester. A year or so ago, Helen gave us some photograph albums from our grandmother's possessions, and they included pictures of Uncle Ray on these camps in France, run by the French village workers in the 1950s and 1960s, as Helen's already mentioned. My Uncle Ray never seemed afraid to talk about his Christian faith. And that's something I'll always remember him for. The fact that God loves good people as well as bad people. And I guess that's a good place to finish. Because we like to remember the good things about people when they've passed on. But of course we all know, don't we, that nobody's perfect. Not even my Uncle Ray. And I guess he'd be the first to admit that. Which is precisely why I guess he knew he needed God's forgiveness. He knew that life could be short. My father was telling me that during the Blitz, one night, the house opposite theirs was hit. The house behind theirs was hit. And when they woke up in the morning, they discovered bombs had landed either side of their house. Ray's parents had prayed that God would protect them. And he'd done just that. That must have had a lasting impression on my Uncle Ray and his brothers. Must have had a real impact on anybody, bringing home the importance of being prepared for eternity. Fun, food and faith. My Uncle Ray, he will be missed. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all of you for uh, those memories and those accounts. That's been not only informative, but giving us a bit of a flavour of the man who we all knew, but in various different ways. So thank you for that. We're going to sing our second hymn now um, on the order of service. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And this hymn reminds us that um, however much we try to please God and to serve him, um, in the end, Christian faith is not about what we do, it is about what God has done, particularly about what the Lord Jesus has done. And so rightly we say, to God be the glory. And the chorus, as we sing that, is an invitation to all of us really, isn't it, to praise the Lord. Let the earth, beyond this hall even, hear his voice, and to come to the Father through Jesus the Son. So let's stand and sing, to God be the glory.
Well, here we are, uh, exactly one year after Ray died. Family here and friends and many who uh, weren't able to be here but are with us uh, in spirit. Well, over four years, of course, since Joyce herself passed away. And we're gathered here to remember Ray and to remember Joyce as well, indeed, and to share something of our sorrows and still, through all of that, to praise God for his grace and goodness. And we should just note that for Ray, in one sense, uh, we lost him in measure even before he died. For some time, uh, his mind and his character in various ways were changed, and he wasn't perhaps the man that we had known. And it therefore has been good for us to be reminded of something of what Ray was and is in our minds and our memories. And, and I guess all of us here, every single one of us uh, who have known Ray, have known him in a different way and will remember different things about him. Uh, I knew Ray as his pastor, uh, as we've heard at uh, Hope Church Goldington, uh, for many years. Um, I don't really know how many years, and uh, I think Ray and Joyce were the kind of people, once they arrived, they felt as though they'd been here forever. But I know they hadn't. Maybe somebody will tell me uh, what year it was when they came to us. And of course, when Ray was at a meeting of any kind, well, uh, you knew he was there because um, certainly if there was a time of open prayer, uh, people would be sitting there quietly with their heads bowed and Ray's booming voice would come over. And if anybody had been a little bit sleepy, they would soon be wide awake. But let me also say, certainly on behalf of Hope Church, and I'm absolutely sure this, this applies to all of the churches and Christian organizations that Ray and Joyce uh, were involved in, uh, we were deeply thankful to God and thankful to them uh, for their presence and for their participation, for the way that they served the Lord Jesus Christ and served his people and served so many people with so many needs. And what I just want to do for a very few minutes now uh, is to uh, mention really just two truths that Ray held to very firmly, uh, things which really guided his life. And of course, they're things that when many of us here would share, but uh, some may not share those, and I thought it was good just to remind ourselves really what it means to be a Christian. Because as I think we've heard, and you know very well, being a Christian is not about getting everything right. It's not about being sorted. It's not even about, let me do my very best to help other people, though we seek to do that. It's actually almost the opposite. It's acknowledging that we failed. We failed others, we failed God, we've even failed ourselves. And asking God for forgiveness, that is what brings us into a relationship with him. So two things very briefly, and some of you will be very familiar with these, but it's good to remind ourselves of what it was that made Ray the Christian man that he was. And the first thing is this, Ray believed that Jesus Christ had died and lived indeed in his place and for him. I'm sure you've noticed there's a theme to the hymns that we're singing today. They're all about Jesus. And that first hymn, it was long, but it was long because it was telling us about Jesus. Right from the beginning, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt amongst men, my example is he. And what an example. Even at the point of his trial, under immense pressure, with all kinds of people out to get him, nobody could find a fault with him. And they had to put, as it were, trumped up charges in order to condemn him to death. And so the hymn goes on to talk about what happened then. His life was totally pleasing to God and perfect. But this is what happened. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins. My Redeemer is he. He could take my sins upon himself because he had no sins of his own to be paid for. He was like us in every way, but without sin. And our second verse, if you were noticing the words as we, our second hymn rather, uh, as we sang that, had a really important emphasis. It's not the quality of your life or even the seriousness of your sin that makes the difference. It is believing and trusting 
in Jesus Christ. That second hymn had this as its second verse, O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Ray had trusted in Jesus. He believed in him. He put his life in his hands. And that was the relationship that continued right up to the end. So that was the first thing. Ray believed that Jesus had lived and died for him. But the second thing, and perhaps especially important on this occasion today, Ray believed that Jesus had defeated the power of death. And that by trusting in Jesus, we too can know new life. And there are two aspects of that. We know new spiritual life now, a relationship with God. But we believe that one day we shall have a new bodily, physical life, the resurrection of our bodies, when Jesus returns and ushers in a new world and a new creation. Again, that first hymn we sang, one day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. And the chorus, um, I remember seeing this as quite a young boy. Uh, it's very, very familiar to me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. That is, put me right with God, freely forever. And the last line, one day he's coming. O oh, glorious day. And I want to say to those of you who are Christian believers and to those who are not, the resurrection and the return of Jesus. Those are truths which we can't just push to one side as kind of obscure pieces of Christian theology. They're actually at the very heart of what we believe. They give us hope in this life and particularly hope for the life to come. We really do believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he ascended into a, a place or heaven that we, that we can't fully understand, but a real place. He's truly there and one day he will return. And Jesus talked about that to his disciples so often. It's almost the thing he wanted them to know after he'd appeared to them when he rose from the dead. I am coming again. Coming with the clouds, as he put it. And every eye will see him. And so that final verse of our second hymn, great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our worship, when Jesus we see. And let me just say to you, there is mystery in that. There's so much that we don't know and don't understand. But we believe that just as Jesus rose, died and rose again, so he will raise us up at the last day. Ray believed that. Many of us here believe that. And it's what gives us hope in a very broken and a very sad world. And especially on a day like this, when we mourn once again, the passing of someone whom we loved. And while we wait for that day, we won't, don't wait idly, do we? We wait as Ray and Joyce did, serving God, serving others, as Jesus himself did, living a life of service and love to others in the hope of a glorious future to come. Well, the Bible tells us to comfort one another with those words. So as we remember the sorrows that come from loss and bereavement, so we can encourage one another. We're going to conclude our service in just a moment with our final hymn uh, on your uh, order of service, Thine be, with thee be the Glory. But I do need to explain just before we sing it, you've already heard that the Reesness family is a significantly multilingual and multicultural family. And so there was a request that uh, with the love of France particularly, and Ray and Joyce loved supporting uh, Christian mission in France, and the love of the French language. And it is a beautiful language, let's acknowledge that, we English speakers. There's a great deal of beauty in the French language. And Ray loved to sing this particular hymn, Thine Be the Glory, uh, in French, particularly uh, the last verse or chorus. So, with your help, when we come to verse 3, we're going to attempt to sing that uh, in French. And you've got the words there on your order of service. Now, some of you here, I realise, who live in France, and others as well, perhaps, are fluent French speakers. Please let the rest of us apologise, at least for our accent. Uh, but we'll make a good effort to sing, and some of you will do a very good job, I know. And if you, you're not up to trying to sing it in French, well, sing the English words if you know them, uh, or, or the English or just hum along. But let's together make a joyful noise to the Lord. Thank you, David.
remain standing as we close. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. And just before um, David uh, plays for us as we close, uh, let me um, just extend a welcome to stay and share some refreshments uh, if you're able to do that. And also just to draw attention to the um, picture uh, and to the comments on the very back of the order of service. It's a remarkable picture that is very Ray Reesness, isn't it? Uh, and uh, if you're wishing to make a donation to uh, Wren Hall uh, Nursing Home, then please feel free to do that. But otherwise, uh, thank you again to Three Rivers Church and all those who've worked to make this possible. Thank you again to family for being here. And thank you for those who've prepared some refreshments for us. And thank you, David, for playing for us. So, thank you. Thank you.